Hello ladies and gentlemen, good to see you again. This is going to be the first part of the first week of lectures and today I'm going to be uh, giving you a bit of an overview of why we use quantitative methods, um, particularly discussing um, the history of, of development of this area um, and also uh, some of the, the ongoing debate between uh, quantitative and, and qualitative approaches to, to understanding the world. And there is an element of, of scientific philosophy here, uh, and I don't want us to get uh, too involved with this, but I just want to point to the fact that this is a huge area of study. Uh, there are entire areas uh, within academia which just specifically focus on understanding the history and philosophy of science. And I just really want to emphasize over the next 10-15 minutes uh, that there's a much larger debate here, which I'm not going to touch on in too much detail, but um, it's important for you to be aware of, particularly as you move towards uh, doing your own research projects, maybe um, a dissertation as part of this course. Um, and then depending on what type of methods you choose, um, when examined on that work, there'll be an expectation that you're able to understand um, the advantages, but also the disadvantages of, of how you've designed that method. Um, so that's going to be a really important uh, uh, part of, of this learning process. So let's just start from the beginning. Um, and then there's a question of, well, where actually did numbers develop? Uh, how long ago was that? Um, and that was about 3,000 years ago. Um, and um, as far as we're aware, the first standardized alphabet uh, was set in Phoenicia um, about 1000 years BC. Um, so that's uh, in the area around uh, Monday, Lebanon, uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, and really, the Phoenicians developed this, the, this way to actually record um, uh, the, uh, the, the quantity of goods which they had because they were a trading nation. So they were very small, but they actually traded all the way along. Um, so this, the North African coastline that you can see here, um, and also um, along what is modern day Greece uh, and Italy, um, and through the Mediterranean coast. And actually, this alphabet that they developed uh, had a heavy influence on the development of the Greek language, and then as a consequence, the development of um, uh, 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 the Roman language. Um, and then uh, that was obviously a key part of, of development uh, within the world. And math generally developed over many millennia as a result of developments in different civilizations. Um, so whether that's the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, Chinese, Persians, as well as many others, often uh, mathematical rules were developed so that we could build buildings or structures and we would know how strong maybe those structures were or how many um, or how large they were going to be and what quantity of materials we needed. So if you think of the Pythagoras theorem um, and, and those types of rules that we have around developing um, and measuring length, for example, um, they were very much used um, to, to, to develop um, structures. Okay, and then if you fast forward to around about the 16th, 17th century, um, there was an important development uh, with Francis Bacon. Um, so essentially Bacon uh, was um, a philosopher, wrote a lot about the scientific method. He's basically um, attributed as being the, the father of the scientific method. And when I say the scientific method here, I, I'm referring to empiricism. Um, and, and what Bacon deduced essentially was that um, all knowledge essentially is derived from basic observation and experience. Um, and this may seem obvious to us now, but it wasn't obvious uh, if you go back uh, five centuries, essentially. Um, and before this point, obviously, there, there was less of a distinction between uh, the sciences um, and religion. And, and that's one of the reasons why, why this is important, because it, it led to um, uh, the, the creation of the age of reason, essentially, and the scientific enlightenment, which took place um, uh, around about three centuries ago. Um, so that's when the modern use of mathematics really began. Um, and if you think of those major events that took place uh, in the 18th century, um, Isaac Newton's publishing of um, his uh, Principia of Mathematics um, essentially was one of the, the key developments. So within that, Newton put forward a range of quantitative tools, um, and those tools were able to understand um, 
how the universe worked, for example. So that included um, you know, elements of, of how gravity works, but, but, but actually providing the quantitative tools enabled people to, to develop and, and actually test hypotheses um, as, as opposed to before where, where there was less of um, an applied mathematical sense to how we understand the world around us. So, so this was a really important development. And actually, both Bacon and Newton have statues at the Library of Congress. Uh, so I've pointed to, to Francis Bacon just here, who's directly ahead from the viewing gallery. Um, unfortunately, Newton you can't see because it's just to the edge of the camera here. Um, but I would definitely recommend you to go to the Library of Congress if you've not been before. It's just behind the Capitol building. Um, but it's definitely one of the most beautiful buildings in North America. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, it just struck me when I was there that there's only, I think, about 12 statues. Um, and both Bacon and Newton uh, are actually uh, within those, those 12 individuals, uh, which just highlights how important the work is that we're doing here um, in terms of um, you know, how we develop knowledge and how scientific understanding has developed over the last three or four centuries. So what do we actually mean by quantitative? Well, um, the Oxford English Dictionary definition when I checked it was basically saying that it's relating to or measured by quantity, which wasn't necessarily uh, that useful. So, so what do we actually mean by quantity? Well, that's uh, the aspect of something which can be measured. So in a number, an amount, a size, or a weight. Um, and I think that is pretty useful because it provides us with an understanding as to what we mean specifically here. And the word specifically comes from, from the Latin quantitas, so that's, that's where it's developed from. Then there's a question of why, or well, why do we measure? Um, and on the one hand, uh, it provides us with a consistent yardstick, essentially. So a standardized way um, to, to make distinctions. And um, I think a good example here is a weather station. And some weather stations have been in place for hundreds of years, uh, monitoring the weather conditions in, in that particular location. And whether it's rainfall, uh, the number of sunlight hours or the temperature, um, we have a, a standardized way to measure that and that allows us to then make comparisons over time about how today or the future weather um, relates to um, some sort of understanding of what the average weather pattern might be, for example, or what the extremes might be of a certain weather pattern. So this is really important. And then secondly, particularly pertinent to what we're doing here as we move towards inferential statistics, um, by measuring we're able to then delineate the difference between different entities, for example, using the scientific method. Um, so that might be um, individuals or species within a population, and we want to understand maybe what affects their growth rates or their development. And we're able to do that using this particular approach, so we can measure uh, and understand um, and, and basically test hypotheses which we, we come up with. So natural science, uh, is quantitative. So um, that's essentially the sciences focused on um, physics, chemistry, biology, earth sciences. And essentially within this type of uh, natural science approach, uh, which uses the scientific method, um, the aim is to try to get some systematic understanding of uh, different phenomena of interest, whatever that may be. Um, so really we're trying to understand general patterns and general relationships and actually, when we look at the social sciences, um, so that also is predominantly quantitative. Um, so, for example, I provided this uh, reference here, um, and these researchers looked at uh, sociology papers which were published between um, 1935 and 2005, so over about 80 years. And actually, about two thirds of those papers were quantitative. So, generally, the majority of social sciences. Um, but I would say particularly over the last 10 years, there's been uh, a revolution in terms of quantitative methods. Uh, and actually, I would say that that's probably going to increase now as we move forward, um, because um, with data science and, and the explosion of data, which we've seen predominantly driven by smartphones and the Internet, um, the whole social sciences is going through this, um, this revolution to a certain extent. Um, of having new sources of, of data to, to analyse, and, and, that, and that means that, that people are going to be doing uh, quantitative analysis. However, 
the debate between quantitative and qualitative methods is extremely tribal. Um, I've experienced this in many places. So within academia, you have hierarchies within subjects. Uh, within subjects, you often have hierarchies based on the methods which you use as well. Um, and um, I think often I've experienced that, that qualitative um, uh, methods, uh, they perhaps and quantitative methods are elevated to a certain extent. I think that's probably the, the, the best way to put it. Um, and uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to both approaches, and, and I will discuss uh, that in this presentation. But um, yeah, you, you really need to be aware that there are these different schools of thoughts, um, and um, especially if you go on to do further, further study, um, that uh, you, you, you some some areas are preferenced, some methods are preferenced over others. So, what exactly do I mean by this? Let's have a look. Well, quantitative research, um, great. You can understand general uh, rules. That's fantastic. Um, however, um, often it's criticised for being reductionist. Um, so, if you look in the social sciences, for example. Um, uh, a quantitative approach might be to reduce a social system down to three key factors which affect um, professional development or human development, um, educational attainment, for example. Um, and uh, I think that that's, that's a beautiful thing, you know, that, that might explain 60% of the variance in the data, but it, obviously that means there's 40% variability that we're not explaining with those few key factors. Um, and this is where it starts to become tribal, um, because... Um, I think generally, for example, if you look at economics, most people are highly quantitative um, and uh, they, they will preference uh, uh, the 60% of um, uh, explainability that the model can provide. Um, but then the qualitative researchers would, would say that this is reductionist and, and that you really want the nuance and the detail which affects um, the whole system. So and, and that they would argue that their qualitative methods are able to capture that additional variance. Um, but this is down to personal preference and flavour. So qualitative research, um, often it's criticised for being poor at generalisability. So, so what do I mean by this generalisability? Well, within the sampling part of this class, we're going to be looking at how maybe you can't survey an entire population, so you just survey a small number of individuals. Um, if you're interviewing, um, say, 10 people, um, you might get very rich information from them, but then the results that you get um, may be very weak if you then try to generalise them to a population of uh, 10,000, for example. Uh, and he herein lies some of the weaknesses of, of qualitative research. Um, they're fantastic at providing you with great context and rich detail, um, but then it's it's... Uh, the, the information that you gain can't be so readily applied to new contexts um, because you maybe um, uh, don't have um, uh, the generalizability that you do when, as when you have quantitative methods, for example. So we, we will, we will uh, cover more about this in the lecture today and also in the class as we start to move towards uh, sampling and understanding samples in relation to, to a population. So what are some of the examples of different methods within these areas? Well, on the left-hand side here, I have some examples of quantitative methods, and most of these we're going to be covering within this course. So descriptive statistics we'll do in the, the following few weeks. Um, we will cover correlations, uh, t-tests, and regressions within the course. Um, I've pointed to predictive methods here because uh, they're hugely important and very popular at the moment, but we won't be doing anything like machine learning um, uh, within this uh, introductory statistics um, course, but you might do that if you if you continue to, to do further study. And then on the qualitative side, well, what are the methods that people use in that area? Um, well, observation and ethnography is a popular technique. Um, uh, and then so also is actually just interviewing people. Often that's a one on one interviewing or if you're interviewing with a group of people, that would be a, a focus group. Um, so these are all very good ways to get rich information. Uh, surveys, so I've done quite a bit of survey work in my time, so 
uh, that's essentially um, developing uh, online these days, um, surveys which you then get people to, to fill out um, and uh, gain information from them on questions of interest. Um, so this is um, a key method used by um, not just social science researchers, but actually a lot of national statistical bureaus. Um, so if you go and get geographic data on labour markets, which you might want to do a study of um, uh, the, the local economy in, a, in one particular state, um, often uh, that recent data um, is collected from surveying companies, for example, and then they extrapolate that data to, to um, a larger area based on some statistical framework. And then finally, I just put document analysis down here. So maybe you have text um, and maybe you, you qualitatively examine those documents very much like a historian might do. Um, and that's a very qualitative um, um, a method to, to understand um, a particular area of interest. I think that with text analysis and the use of quantitative methods to analyze text, um, the, these last two um, uh, quantitative and qualitative methods are actually overlapping quite a bit. So there are a lot of people, even within the department these days, who are, um, are using Twitter, for example, to take information and do sentiment analysis. So you're taking qualitative words, but then you're actually um, trying to understand quantitatively um, uh, what they mean or, or, or investigate a particular area of interest. Okay, so that just covers a very basic introduction to um, why we do quantitative research, what the history of numerical analysis is, um, and I've provided you with a chapter reference here for, for further reading within um, the McGrew textbook, which I've already highlighted uh, is important for this course because I'll be providing um, weekly reading um, within, within that text. Okay, thank you very much, and I look forward to um, being with you again uh, in the next part of the lecture. Thank you.